processing data in fundamentally new ways. And we are just scratching the surface of the 21st century. With each decade, the pace of innovation seems only to accelerate. The wonders of what the future holds And we are just scratching the surface of the 21st century. With each decade, the pace of innovation seems only to accelerate. The wonders of what the future holds are beyond what most can imagine. As we dwell deeper into the first interpretation of Daniel 12, 4, the prophecy indicating the surge in technological progress and advancements in transportation, we find ourselves marveling at the expanse of human achievement and the burgeoning horizons of understanding. The ancient world would have gazed in stunned wonder at the technological marvels we casually engage with in our everyday lives. Imagine handing a smartphone to someone from the 18th century, or even someone from the 15th century. It would blow their mind. This pace of knowledge acquisition and innovation hasn't merely been linear. It has been exponential. With each passing century, our advances haven't just added to our capabilities. They have multiplied them. One might argue that the most significant shift began with the Industrial Revolution. As machines started to replace manual labor and industry began to boom, knowledge started its uphill trajectory. This wasn't just about learning new ways to build and produce. It was about understanding how the world could change when production was exponentially increased. Every new invention, every new idea, built upon those that came before it creating a cascading effect of knowledge building upon knowledge. The 20th century is often hailed as a century of unparalleled innovation. Just think about it. In the span of 100 years, we progressed from horse-drawn carriages to landing a man on the moon. We went from simple telegrams to global internet connectivity. The fact that we can, today, hold a device in our palm that possesses more computational power than the machines that sent the first man to space is a testament to the speed at which knowledge is increasing. The second interpretation of Daniel 12.4 paints an insightful image of spiritual introspection, suggesting that humanity's quest is not merely about crossing physical realms or accumulating mundane knowledge. Instead, it delves deep into the heart of spiritual enlightenment, where individuals, especially in the last days, will immerse themselves in the scriptures, striving for a deeper understanding and, subsequently, witnessing a phenomenal increase in spiritual knowledge. Renowned theologians and biblical scholars emphasize that the phrase, many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased is not a metaphorical nod to the rapidity of modern transportation or the progression of worldly education. Instead, it directs our gaze towards an intimate journey through God's Word. This viewpoint suggests that as the end times approach, there will be a remarkable surge in God's people earnestly delving into prophetic scriptures, seeking guidance, clarity and insight as they immerse themselves in the Divine Word. Indeed, this interpretation holds undeniable reality. Never before has mankind demonstrated such an in-depth understanding and appreciation of biblical prophecy as witnessed in our contemporary era. The knowledge reservoir available to our generation regarding the scriptures is unparalleled in human history. Interestingly, the very technological progress alluded to in the first interpretation plays an instrumental role in this profound spiritual awakening advanced technology has remarkably amplified our ability to explore and comprehend the scriptures. Thanks to the digital revolution, the Holy Bible is now accessible in numerous translations, formats and platforms. Whether one seeks solace in the tangible pages of a book, listens to an audio version during a commute, or browses through a digital verse on a smartphone, the Word of God is ever-present, waiting to be discovered and internalized. The vast expanse of the internet facilitates swift and comprehensive scripture searches, fostering global communities of believers eager to exchange insights, interpretations and testimonies. This era stands as a testament to humanity's unparalleled access to biblical wisdom. 
we find ourselves in a golden age where understanding God's word with enhanced clarity and depth has become a tangible reality. A plethora of resources, from commentaries to online sermons, beckon us to delve deeper into the sacred texts, unraveling the mysteries of prophetic passages and obtaining a clearer vision of God's divine blueprint for creation. While the acceleration of technology has undoubtedly bolstered this spiritual renaissance, it would be remiss to overlook the paramount role of the Holy Spirit. It is this divine essence that illuminates our hearts and minds, granting us the wisdom to discern and internalize the profound teachings of the scripture. This may shock you. However, do you know that you and I have more information about God than the apostles? Do you know that you and I have more knowledge of God than the apostle Paul? We know for certain that Paul wrote at least 13 letters that are included in the New Testament. However, Paul didn't get to read the book of Revelation. But yet you and I can right now open the book of Revelation and search the scripture. The Bible, the Bible is at your fingertips. There are literally thousands of commentaries, hundreds of versions of the Bible at your fingertips. This is so different to any other time in the history of mankind. We have access to every single verse in the Bible being dissected and analyzed by people who spend their whole lives reading the Bible. Knowledge shall increase, and how it has. I mean, you don't even have to read the Bible. You can be in the shower and be listening to the Word of God. You can be in your car and can listen to the Bible being read to you. You can be doing other things and still listen and learn about the Word of God. Some of you listening to me right now may be even doing other things whilst you are listening but you are still learning of the Word of God. If you are young in your faith back in my generation, you would have to wait until the next time you go to church to learn more about the Bible, but right now you have access to different pastors and their teachings on the internet. In other words, people will be looking for answers. People will want to know more about things to come. People will desire to find answers and know what will happen in the future. They will want to know about the end time, and as a result, people will begin to understand more and more about the Bible. Never before in history have we had such access to biblical knowledge, and we are blessed to be living in a time when we can study and understand God's Word with greater clarity and depth. We have access to resources that can help us to dive deeper into the Scriptures, to explore the prophetic passages, and to gain a greater understanding of God's plan for the world. And while technological advancements have played a part in this increase in knowledge, it is ultimately the work of the Holy Spirit that allows us to understand and interpret God's Word. As we seek the truth through prayer and study, the Spirit guides us and gives us insight and understanding that we could never attain on our own. ...moment in the tribulation period, there exists a faction of interpreters and scholars who argue that the prophecy concerning the abomination of desolation, as depicted in Daniel 9, found its fulfillment in the historical figure of Antiochus Epiphanes. They argue that his notorious desecration of the Jewish temple and his severe persecution of the Jewish people during the second century correspond to the prophetic imagery laid out in Daniel's vision. However, a careful examination of Matthew 24 reveals a critical clarification made by none other than Jesus Christ himself. In this passage, Jesus explicitly references the abomination of desolation as a forthcoming event, one that is poised to transpire in the end times, specifically during the Great Tribulation. By doing so, he delineates a clear distinction between past historical events and the future fulfillment of prophecy indicating that the true realization of Daniel's vision lies ahead in the eschatological timeline. This blasphemous act serves as a wake-up call for believers and fulfills Jesus' warnings in the Gospels, prompting them to understand the times and stand firm in their faith. Piecing these verses together, it becomes clear that the temple's existence is prophetic. Before the events of the end times unfold, a temple must be present to serve as the backdrop against which these profound events play out. Its role is pivotal in God's grand narrative. The concept of constructing a temple in today's political landscape seems almost inconceivable.
The intricacies of international diplomacy, regional tensions, religious differences, and deeply entrenched historical contexts make such an endeavor fraught with challenges. One might question how, in a world as interconnected and as attuned to the nuances of global politics as ours, a temple could be built without igniting a series of conflicts. The Bible makes it clear that a third temple will be built. One of the biggest signs that the end times are here will be the start of construction on this third temple. When we see the third temple being built, we can be sure that the end of days is very close. The construction of the temple stands as an unmistakable beacon, signaling the arrival of a time that has long been foretold. Its towering presence will not just be an architectural marvel, but rather a spiritual touchstone, signaling that the narrative of human existence is rapidly approaching its climax. For the believers and those acquainted with prophetic scriptures, the temple's rising structure will be both a confirmation of biblical prophecy and a solemn reminder of the imminent trials ahead. The reign of the Antichrist will mark a period of profound transformation. While many will be enthralled by his charisma, power, deception, and false promises, those familiar with sacred scriptures will recognize his rule as a pivotal phase in the unfolding end time saga. His dominion will span continents, influencing nations and leaders, consolidating power in ways that are both overt and insidious. His aura will captivate many, leading them down paths they once thought unimaginable. Yet, beneath this facade of charm and authority will lie a web of deceit, manipulation, and an evil hunger to be worshipped. However, thank God, the rapture of the church will have taken place, a momentous event that will resonate across the spiritual realm. 1 Corinthians 15, 51, 52 Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed, in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16-17 For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. The tribulation's first half will be a time of unprecedented upheaval. Natural disasters, societal breakdowns, and widespread despair will grip the world. This period, while intensely challenging, is but the precursor to even graver events. Yet, it is during these trying times that God will go to extraordinary lengths to bring people to Christ. Amidst the chaos, there will be an opportunity, a window of grace. The narrative isn't solely about doom and retribution. It underscores a fundamental truth that even in the bleakest moments, salvation remains within reach. God will send the two witnesses. God will send the three angels and all of whom will preach the gospel. Here we have something that is unusual. Here we have something that has never ever happened before. Never in the history of mankind has there been an event like this. Never in the history of mankind have angels been seen flying. Three angels fly through the sky, each of them calling out their messages. One brings the gospel and a call to worship God. The second brings an announcement of the fall of Babylon. The third warns of the wrath of God upon all who worship the beast and have his mark upon them. When the world is taking its final nosedive, and the Antichrist and the false prophet are at their most prominent, God goes to unusual lengths. God goes to lengths that he has never gone to before, to warn the world. He warns the final generation to fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come, and to worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. But interestingly enough, the third angel warns humanity not to take the mark of the beast. This third angel's announcement warns that a terrible fate awaits those who persist in worshipping the Antichrist. This angel highlights the connection between worshipping the beast and his image and receiving his mark on your forehead or on your hand. 
In plainer words, taking the mark of the beast will be a declaration of worship. No one will accidentally take the mark of the beast. The connection between worshipping the beast and taking the mark will be clear. We see once again God in his great grace and mercy calls sinners to repent in the final hour, or they will face the terrible judgment of the Antichrist. Those who drank the harlot's wine of the passions of her immorality will also drink the wine of the wrath of God. To drink the wine of the wrath of God is to experience his wrath. So who are these angels and what message do they bring on earth? These angels are not just ordinary angels, but they are three special angels sent by God to deliver a crucial message to the people on earth. The first angel comes to proclaim the everlasting gospel, calling all people to fear and worship God. Revelation chapter 14 verses 6 through 7. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of water. The wonderful thing is that this angel will fly around the sky close enough to the earth to be seen and heard by all humanity. I don't know how God has this worked out, but the angel will be able to preach the everlasting gospel and communicate with every tongue. So language won't be a barrier for this angel. It is possible that this angel will be able to speak the native language of whatever country he is flying over at the same time. Possibly, if he's flying over France, he will speak French. If he's flying over Portugal, he will speak Portuguese. We don't know the specifics. However, what we do know for sure is that this angel will be able to communicate with everyone. This angel proclaims the gospel of God to everyone on earth, regardless of tribe, race, and status. The angel reminds the inhabitants of the earth of the coming judgment and instructs them to worship and fear the Lord. He alone is to be glorified and worshiped. Any other God of whatsoever form, for whatsoever reason, but Him. This message calls all people to recognize God as the creator of the universe and the one worship and fear the Lord. He alone is to be glorified and worshiped. He made it clear in Exodus chapter 20 verse 3 that we should not worship any other God of whatsoever form, for whatsoever reason, but Him. This message calls all people to recognize God as the creator of the universe and the one who deserves our worship and obedience. The first angel's message is not only a call to worship and to fear God, but also an invitation to receive the salvation that comes through faith in Jesus Christ. A call to fear the Lord is a call to obey Him, to shun sin, to walk in His will, to walk in righteousness, and to do everything that pleases Him. This angel proclaims loudly, for the hour of His judgment has come, and this message of judgment will be heard by many across the world. A great multitude will come to know Christ as Savior during this period, because the judgment of God is so evident on earth during this time of the Great Tribulation, it is no wonder why the crowd of those saved through the Great Tribulation can't be numbered. God will, time and time again, give sinners the opportunity to repent. Whilst the world is at its worst and the Antichrist is at his height of power, God will send his two witnesses. He will send these three angels we have spoken about today, and all of them will warn sinners and call them to repentance. If people persist in their sinful ways and even persist to reject the gospel message as they are literally seeing the book of Revelation unfolding before their own eyes, then they will have no one to blame for all of eternity except themselves. This is